<laughs> okay, hi everybody. I was just testing to make sure that the camera was working. I'm David Butler. <laughs> I'm Emily Freeman. This is Don't Miss This. So glad y'all are here. Second week in a row with a real life book. I just like that I wrote stuff in it. And so now I'm doing that. And I'm making people happy who think I'm looking at my phone while she's talking and being rude. So I'm a nice guy. Okay, um, we're doing Jacob 5. Everybody's this 5 is... through 7. Okay, we should say this first. Okay. Jacob thinks he's going to say goodbye after chapter 6. He actually says goodbye. He's like, bye. And then 7, he's like, oh, never mind. Let me tell you about the story of a man who's an antichrist. And 7 is super interesting for those trying to like learn a lesson about um, those who like oppose and are deliberately trying to undermine faith. But we're just we're not going to spend a lot of time in that one. But we just wanted to let y'all know his second bit that he thought he was. It's cool that he said goodbye and the Lord was saying, "No, I need you to write chapter seven. It's also and so, even better because he probably must have hated how he said goodbye at the end of chapter six. You because want... see how he learned a new language at the end of chapter seven. Don't tell him. The last word. <laughs> Oh, you don't want me to say it? Yeah. Oh, okay. Go don't they want to look it up? Go look okay. it up. So that's just neat that chapter 7 is this additional spot that the Lord thought, no, I really want that to be in the record. Make sure you write that also. So we're not going to study that. You'd think that we would since <laughs> I just gave you how important it is. Um, but we love chapter 5 too much. That's impossible for us to do it's chapter impossible. 7. So we are going to camp most of our time in Jacob chapter 5, which Jacob didn't even write. He copied it from a guy whose name is Zenus, and you want to meet him because he actually writes one of the raddest chapters in the whole Book of Mormon. Yes, so that's you're so like, true. Who, who is, is this guy? Yeah. Um, What's so fun is he'll have a really short line in heaven because no one knows who he is. So <laughs> secret, you won't even need a fast pass to meet him. <laughs> and let's just come out of where we were last week in case you didn't watch these back to back. Because remember Jacob ends last week and he's like, let, let me tell you the answer. You've got to look, you've got to focus on the mark. That's what you have to do. And then chapter five becomes, because he says to them, okay, the, this is what you've got to do. You got to fo you can't reject the sure foundation. It has to become the head of the corner. And then he's going to say, I will unfold this mystery unto you if I do not by any means get shaken from my firmness in the spirit and stumble because of my over anxiety for you. And then he teaches this. That's what happens. He teaches five. And it's going to be how to focus on the mark, one. But two, in order to really understand five, you kind of need to know a little bit about fruit trees. Do you have any? Nope. Okay. I wish I had a peach tree. Okay, you can get one this year. Um, I planted one in my old house, then we moved. We have peach trees. We love peach trees so much. And Greg is really good at pruning peach trees. You don't just know how to prune. That is what I've learned. You Like someone has to pass it down to you. How is it going to work? Or and you just hire someone. Zenus is going to teach us how, but this is the point of pruning. This is why you do it. If you want really good peaches, like those gigantic ones that you get in the store, this is so hard because my personality wants to not prune. My I personality want to keep... wants to go to the store. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I want to keep all the branches, everybody. And when the peaches come, I want to keep all the peaches. Like, I don't want to lose anything. But if you want the big peaches, you have to get rid of some of the branches like a lot of them because you need the sun to get all the way to all the fruit this every fruit has to have equal amounts of the sun that's what has to happen so a good pruner knows how to like pull the branches out that are keeping the bottom branches from seeing the sun that's the first thing the second thing is you can't crowd out the fruit so you also have to go through this process of like Going out the other and then when you remove the branches that are growing up in the center that prevent the light from getting to the fruit and you remove the clutter so that there's nothing in the way that's the best way for the fruit to grow so you kind of have to know that going in okay are you smarter now <laughs> yes, I feel I'm still gonna go to Costco. Um, and this, I, if you the peach see trees a peach are cool. Tree, come to my backyard. I'll show you how it's done. <laughs> um, what's awesome about this is if you will look up, you, if you really want to get smart into the Book of Mormon with this particular allegory, so many articles have been written in BYU Studies and the Religious Center magazine, Book of Mormon Central, um, just about actually how incredibly um, accurate Jacob Five is for a boy who does not know about olive trees 
and how like just the everything about this chapter is actually like you know we talk about like some of the internal evidences of the book of mormon mm -hmm. being a, this master craft that joseph did in 60 days on borrowed time and bedrooms and paper um this is an example of it it's just phenomenal this chapter one of of so many uh, before we start we're going to kind of look at this chapter in two different ways the first way is, do you remember, let's go back to the title page of the Book of Mormon where it talks about what is the purpose of this book. And this line was, which is to show the remnant of the house of Israel what great things the Lord has done for their fathers, that they may know the covenants of the Lord and that they are not cast off forever. And also to convince the Jew and the Gentile that Jesus is the Christ manifesting himself to all nations. And we talked about the beginning of the year, one of the co the great contributions of the Book of Mormon is it tells the whole covenant story from beginning of the house of Israel all the way until the millennium and how God is j just is patient and moves through this entire story until he has all of his children all together in Zion, in the kingdom, Jew and Gentile, everybody, and everything he's doing in this huge, broad story. The Bible tells us really well what the covenants were and what the promises were to the house of Israel. The Book of Mormon tells us the big story. And one of the great places it does that is in chapter 5. So one of the ways to read chapter 5 is reading the whole covenant story. Look what God's doing with the house of Israel from its inception all the way to millennium. And that's where we're going to start because we we want you to have that foundation. That's going to be important. So for the first bit, we're going to talk about what even is that and how do you see it in this? Because you go in and you're like, this is a story about trees. And as you're reading it, you might be like, how am I even going to teach this to my family? It feels like a lot of stuff. Plus, it is so long. When it's I showed it to my verses. seminary yeah. kids the other day, they were like, oh, did you see how many verses are in here? And it, it is. It's a lot. Um, whenever I teach a parable, and we've talked about this before, so this is just a reminder. Whenever you are going to teach a parable, make sure whoever you're teaching has a blank piece of paper and something to color with. Crayons, colored pencils. They can even use a pen if they want to. Um, <laughs> like it doesn't have to be their best drawing. But when you study a parable, you you need to see it. You you can't just hear it. There is too much going on here to just listen. So you're gonna want to um, be able to hear or to see what's going on here. Yeah. Also, it's kind of neat that it's really long because right off the bat we learn that God is in the long game with the house of Israel, with people as individuals, that is, he's just like his nature and character, which we'll get into, which is kind of the heart and soul of the whole chapter mm -hmm. and the whole allegory. But he really is in a long game. So I like that it's not five verses long because yeah. it's like you kind of feel like, oh, he's going to be patient with every single one of us. But for those wanting to see what's the contribution of the Book of Mormon and the covenant story, um, the olive tree um, is, he tells you, these are, you'll find actually in the chapter. Um, and right here, you've got some things that you can label. The tame olive tree is the house of Israel. This would be God's covenant people, people who have entered into this reciprocal covenant relationship with him. Um, the vineyard is the whole world. And then the wild olive trees are the Gentiles or those who were not um, covenant people. They were not of the house of Israel. And so those are the characters, the master of the vineyard, um, you could see as the Lord. It's an allegory. So can you like bring about different interpretations? Sure. And he has servants who are working for him. Um, in some interpretations, I've seen that the master is God the Father and the servant is Jesus. In other interpretations, I've seen the master as Jesus and the servant as like prophets, missionaries, moms, mm -hmm. um, Sunday school teachers, like people who are working. So that really won't matter too much because the, the idea is going to stay the same um, with those. But that's what that is. There is a timeline of the whole house of Israel. And it helps you so much if you know the timeline. So w that is one thing that we want to do. As you go through, if you realize, okay, at this point he's talking about before Christ. At this point he's talking about Christ's time. At this point he's talking about the apostasy. At this point he's talking about um, the events leading up to the millennium. 
if you can mark those in and you might want to like permanently put those at the top of your scriptures because otherwise it just seems like a whole bunch of pruning and preserving and digging and trading branches is going on. But if you know the timeline right off the bat, you are smarter just for knowing the timeline. So yeah. you are going to tell us okay. what each of the verses Let me give mean. you these verses. You know, right, so them right here. Verse 3 is just the foundation of the house of Israel. When God makes covenant relationship and chooses the house of Israel to like be his covenant people. 4 through 14 on the timeline is uh, from the time of Jacob or Israel is his name all the way to the end of the Old Testament. So you, Malachi. You might put like before Christ came right. in there. It's just going to sum up all of that time. So you're kind of watching what God's doing with the house of Israel during that period of time. Okay, then you have 15 through 28, which is the time of Jesus and the apostles. Then you have verses 29 to 49, and that is the time of the great apostasy. Then you have 50 through 74. This is the time of gathering, which will include starting in 1820. And then you're going to see some of our time period also in there. The whole scene leading up to verse 75, which is the millennium. And then there's a verse in there, verse 77, about the end of the millennium. There's one more little scene at the end of the millennium. So this is the whole story. And you're seeing it just... It started thousands of years before Christ came and that it's not going to fully wrap up until the end of that thousand years of him ruling and reigning on the earth. When you see grafting happening, um, sometimes you're seeing branches being taken to other parts of the vineyard. Um, That is a symbol of the scattering of Israel. You also might find like the Nephites being taken off of the tree and moved to another part of the vineyard. And then you're going to uh, see them well. come back, which will be really interesting. So you want to be watching for like all this movement of branches is really a movement of people. That's what you want to be thinking of. Right. And do remember that first God has the this this family, the house of Israel, who we would call like Jews that he's giving the covenant to when they reject it in our time period. Well, in first in Peter's time period, it moves to the Gentiles, right? In our time period also. And so you're going to see like all of those things in there. If you're so into like seeing this and wanting to study it, that's so awesome. You're going to need to spend some more time on it. And there's some great commentaries Mm -hmm. about it that will be helpful for this big wide, like picture Mm -hmm. and study. Um, but if you're just like, that's not me right now. Um, and, and maybe if you have little kids or you're teaching the Sunday school class, this next part that we're going to talk about might help it become like really relevant starting like Mm -hmm. right now in the big story, what you for sure see is a God who is not giving up until he has brought the whole family together into his kingdom. That, that is like the Mm -hmm. big overarching lesson is a God who won't stop reaching out to and it, until he finishes his purposes yeah, and his work right like you really see him doing his work and remember his work um it tells us is to bring to pass the um eternal life of man that's his work but really his work is people yeah. and and this is just another way of showing us his work is it's people it's gathering it's saving and in fact, before we jump to our very most favorite way to teach Jacob 5, which we are going to get to at the end, um, this is a good, it, whether you go this direction when you teach it, or if you go this direction, this part right here in the middle is going to help both ways because it really does introduce us a little bit to the father and the plan and, um, and the father and the son and the plan of the vineyard as a whole. And there's a couple words you just want to watch for. So the first one we see in verse 4, and um, it's going to talk about... And again, when she said like this part down here, that means like us as individuals. So you can kind of see big picture, whole house of Israel. But really, what is the house of Israel except a whole bunch of people, individual people? Yep. And and we love looking at Jacob 5 through like my eyes and your eyes and your eyes like what's the lesson for you and for your little family and that little group of Sunday school kids that you teach Um, we want to see the big picture but we also want to see how Jesus meets us where we are and that's what we're going to find 
Um, <laughs> I got so excited about this chapter. I, know. I almost had to let out a... <laughs> um, so there's three things that you just want to notice right off the bat because they are repeated over and over again no matter how you study. One is the word prune. Um, that's... Well, should we point out in verse 4 it says when he notices that they're decaying? Yes. Or meaning like that would be like a breaking of a relationship with him. They're kind of turning away from covenant relationship with him. And when he sees that, then he starts doing his work. And, yeah. and, and his work's going to include pruning. We're going to see that through here. Um, you're going to see, and, and it might be fun to show that one video. Who, who's the video that we love of when he prunes the, um, the little bush and it cries? Oh, the current, the current bush. bush. We will link to Hubie that video. Brown's. Hubie Brown's current bush. And then Elder uh, Christofferson retells it. Yeah, we will link to that. I love the name Hubie Brown. I thought his name was Hubie. <laughs> like, I didn't know it was Hugh B. Period yes. Brown. I thought it was Hubie. Oh, I was awesome. like, what a good name. So you love um, that pruning is a process. And sometimes what he does hurts a little bit, right? It's a little bit painful. Um, you also love that he's going to nourish. We're going to see that part happening. And there's going to be a part in verse 67, I think, where it tells us he dungs. 47. 47. So the verses here, you're finding all these different words. Of you know, what's, that are what's in he there. doing. And in verse 47, he's also, he dungs it. and Which is not your most pleasant part of being a tree, right? That's <laughs> just true. <laughs> and so I think it's important to realize that like some of the Lord working with us is painful. Sometimes it's like uncomfortable. Sometimes it stinks. You know, sometimes it's, just, it's crappy. Yeah, <laughs> it's just <laughs> as you look at it, you're like, this is true. Like that, that is true about my life. But, and so you want to be looking for those truths. Yeah, and what's how, awesome is how he works with us. Yeah, because all those things are uncomfortable, but they lead to growth. Yeah. And there are so many people in here who could say, maybe you're in the middle of of a pruning season or a dunging season, and you're like, my life is dungy it's crappy right now but i can see the growth that um that comes from it yeah um we love also it's gonna talk you're gonna see the word preserve something you might want to do with your kids is try and underline everywhere you see the word preserve in all of chapter five uh you're gonna see it at least 20 times in there that is a word that becomes so important to this allegory I almost called it a parable, and I think I actually did call it a parable earlier. It really is an allegory. Um, you're going to see that all the way through here, and let me tell you what is important about that. When we study the word redeem or redeemer, one of the very first definitions of that word redeem is preserve. Um, the word redeem means preserve, deliver, rescue by any means. That's what redeem means. But you love that that word preserve is just front and center. That is the important part of his job as a redeemer is actually to preserve. Um, the word preserve means to guard or to keep. So it's interesting as you're looking at that word being so important in this allegory as we're going through and thinking about it. Um, and he keeps saying like, I am doing this that I may preserve or what if you replace it with redeem yeah or, keep. or rescue I'm doing this or that deliver. i may like uh yeah. we love at the end of 14 when it says and sometimes he takes these branches off and he puts them in different places and some people might ask why did i get planted here and why did i get put in this mm -hmm. circumstance and the lord says at the end of 14 he's doing this all according to his will and pleasure um i love that it's not a chore it's his pleasure to do this. It's yeah. his, it's, it's what I want to do. And his will is good. Right. Um, we have to remember that. It's good. Like everything he's doing is for good. Um, I also think as you're going through and, and circling those words that are preserved, you're going to see like in verse 41, he also weeps over his vineyard. The, the, this work is not fun all the time. Uh, not for us and not for him. And you love that he cares so much that there are even moments where he just weeps. And this is going to take us to the part that we love of mm. Jacob 5. This is our favorite part. Is one of the greatest lessons you will learn from Jacob 5 is the character of Christ. And you may want to just start at verse 1 and read all the way through to the end. And all you are looking for is the character of Christ. Pretend that trees are people. 
as you read it and just watch what he does. And that is the way that you're going to do it. If a tree is a person, then watch what he does with, with his people. And that's what's going to help you notice like what he's like. And we want to go through and just tell you some of the things so that you, so you're like, oh yeah, I, now I see what I'm looking for. Um, just some of our favorites. So we gave you some spaces here and we've also given you some verses for hints. Um, it looks like there's only four things, but we just put four spots. Like this could just keep on going. Right, so use that we, blank we page found in the journal. Seven, just as we were looking. And you're going to probably find more, but let us just give you some. Um, I'll start with the first one. You pick whichever ones you want to talk about. We'll go every other one. Okay, okay. that would be fun. Um, I love when he talks about in verse 7, and he says, And it came to pass that the master of the vineyard saw it, and he said unto his servant, It grieveth me that I should lose this tree. This is what I love. He doesn't look out, and he's like, I'm worried that I'm going to lose half the crop. He's worried that he's going to lose this tree. Like, that one tree is so concerning to him. So I think the first thing we learn about the character of Christ is he doesn't want to lose even one. That just even this tree is important enough for him to come and to bring his servant and to sit there and say, okay, what could we do for this tree? Okay, there's a really big lesson. You can just think about that for one whole night. Yeah, and remember that story we love so much from President Packer talking to that seminary teacher oh, who had like the, the, the kid in the class who was just a pain in the butt and like had his head down all the time and he just didn't like you know and he and if he came he was bothering people and he was causing a ruckus and he wouldn't pay attention and it was just constant he was constantly fighting against this kid and he finally goes into the principal and the kid hasn't been there for a long time and which has been kind of nice because he's <laughs> actually been able to teach his lesson and he goes into the principal and he's like okay he hasn't been here for this many days at what point can we just say we're done with him like at, at what point are we just like we did the best we could we're done and the seminary principal just looks at him for a minute and then he says well what if he was your son at which point would you want to say i'm done i'm done with this one um, when, when would you want the seminary teacher to say that and when we both heard that we heard it on the same night and we both that was like life-changing to think about he doesn't give up he doesn't give up on that one tree. He just doesn't. It isn't in his nature. The character of Christ is he's going to go after that one. That's yeah. the first thing we learn. And, and the word grieve. Like I'm not bothered yeah. or annoyed or I'm grieved that I would lose this particular tree. I mean, I hope everybody listening to this and everybody that you know too believes that and feels mm -hmm. that about God, that he would be grieved. Yeah. To ever lose you. Um, this next set of verses has a couple. I love that he says, uh, like in verse 20 at the very end, he says, For behold, said he, this long time have I nourished it. Uh, I, I love that it's the, like what I said at the beginning about the whole house of Israel, but with a particular person that he's like, I don't care if it takes 20 years. I don't care if it takes 200 years. I am going to keep trying to um, nourish this person. I love in 22 when he says to him, by the way, I knew you were in a poor spot of ground. <laughs> and that is why I nourished you for such a long time. And do you like that it's nourished also and not fed? Like he's not throwing slop to the pigs. Like, oh, I just, mm -hmm. I fed the chickens. I fed the pigs. He's like, I nourished it. I really was particular about what I gave and I and it was consistent. This wasn't a one or two time deal. It was yeah, long it was a time. Long time. I love that. I love um, when he says in verse forty nine. Um, this is such a great verse, and especially as we talk about grace and the grace of Christ, um, because he says this in verse forty nine. There's two phrases here that are so important. First of all, what could I have done more? I love that thought, particularly as you think about the atonement of Jesus Christ. What could I have done more? And in that same verse, he says, for I have done all. He, he did all of it. He did all he could do. He, he did. He gave us. He saved us. He preserves us. He redeems us. Um, and remember we talked about, and, and all we have to do is just believe him that, that he did that for us. 
And, and we obviously show that belief through how we live because of that. But even when we think about Jacob last week when he was like, could you just look to my death? Could you take yeah. up the cross? Um, could you remember that what more can I do? I have done all that I could do, and I love the thought of that. And this, there's a whole lot of verses here. Um, and in those, you might want to circle every time that it says the word again. Mm -hmm. uh, in 60, it's three times. 61, 63, 58, 67. Uh, he uses the phrase in 64 once more. But just there's this idea of let's go again. Let's try again. Let's do this one more time. I love seeing that. I've been mm -hmm. thinking about the story of the first vision and Joseph getting the plates and how awesome that he goes to the hill and the Lord's like, okay, you're not ready. Come back again. <laughs> okay. Not yet. Come back again. Come back again. I lost the plates. Okay. Let's try again. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the story of God's character that he's just like, I'm just going to, and I love once more, you know, that someone might've said like this, this dude's lost. Let's like chalk it up as a sunk cost. And the Lord's like, how about just one more time? Can we try just once more and go again? And yeah. I love that about him. I think it, you bring up such a good point because a lot of times when we talk about the word restoration, and that's a word we are going to be talking about a lot right now. Between now and conference, we are going to be thinking about this restoration process. And a lot of times we think about that word and we think about the church. Like we go to details. Um, what was restored? What happened because of Joseph Smith? And we start thinking about the priesthood and covenants. And we may, probably everyone has made that list on the chalkboard. And sometimes I want to stop and think to myself, at the same time when God was doing the work of restoring a church, he was also doing the work of restoring a boy. Like we watch him restore mm -hmm. that boy into who he knew that boy could be. And that's a painful process. And it's a, a making of mistakes and it's messy. And it's him saying, okay, again, Joseph, again, and one more time. And nope, that wasn't right. Let's do it again. And we sometimes forget that prophets are also in a restoration process. And we are yeah. too, right? You look at the process of even revelation. That's part of a restoring, right? Revelation is God just doesn't come down or reach down and be like, do it just like this. This is all the details. This is exactly how it goes. No. Think about Nephi, right? We got to go get the plates, okay? What do you think we should do? Well, I feel like I should just go ask for them. Okay, do it. He goes and does it. Comes back. Nope, that wasn't right. Now what should we do? Well, I feel like we should take all of our gold and silver. Okay, go do that. Was that right? Nope, that wasn't right. Okay, well, should we give up? Should we not get the plates? Did God was God lying? Did he were we not really supposed to do this? Like we forget that often God's process is try again. Okay, try again. Okay, try again. And this time, all right, you got it. Now let's move to the next thing. Um that that word again is important for us. It's mm -hmm. it's even important now because we are watching a prophet who still in the process of revelation, who's still doing this, okay, again, and again, and again, right? We, we watch. Restoration, it's messy. We belong to a living church, and living is messy. It just is. It's mm -hmm. pruning, and dunging, and nourishing, and it's moving things, and it's doing whatever the Lord says. The servant is like, I don't really know why we're doing that, yeah. but okay, you want me to move these over here? Okay. And then two seconds later, he's like, okay, wait, I just moved these. I'm moving these back again right now. He even argues with the Lord like yes. a couple of times in yes. there. It's just like, we, we, we did already this did already. this. Um, the, and you just watch the patience of the Lord as he's like, okay, again and again. Um, we've got to remember that that is part of our belief. Uh, we've got to give more grace to the people who are doing the Lord's work. We have to. We need grace, but we need to also give grace and because the Lord's just doing his work and his work is messy work. It is. Yeah, and it's cool that you bring that up because so many times in here 
Like check out verse 52 where he says, the Lord of the vineyard says, let us take of the branches and let us graft them in and let us and we. And there's so many times where the Lord calls us in to this and he knows that he just made it a mess by bringing people in. But he's trying to exalt the servant and preserve the servant at the same time he's trying to preserve the tree. And in Nephi's story, he cares just as much about Laban as he does about Nephi as well. And so he is just working and doing mm-hmm. with all these people. I do have, let's share this verse. I found it today. I think it got added with the update. <laughs> um, but we're, It didn't get added, everybody. <laughs> um, it, does, it says this. This is back in 2 Nephi 30. He says, in the gospel of, verse 5, the gospel of Jesus Christ shall be declared among them, wherefore they shall be restored unto the knowledge of their fathers and the knowledge of Jesus Christ, which was had among them. And then this restoration also, verse 8, It shall come to pass, the Lord God shall commence his work among all nations, kindreds, tongues, and people to bring about the restoration of his people Hmm. upon the earth. That that is what, that's how the scriptures talk about restoration. The church was established, but it's a restoration of his people. And of blessings. And you look at that word restore and you are going to see that it's talking about Restored to health, restored to faith, restored to goodness. Um, that word restore, there's a lot about that word we don't understand. And I think we would do better if we did. So you, that's that might be something. I mean, this was a tangent. We just took a tangent, but it's worth it before conference. Take no, a little second. No, this was the same. It's what this is all about. about this um, really, listen, restoring. this chapter is, is restoration heavy. Mm. I mean, it's talking about like, what is the restoration? And President Nelson keeps talking about gathering of Israel and stuff yeah. like that. It's like, it's the work of people and restoring them back oh, to so a knowledge good. of the Father and to Jesus and, and, and to the blessings and promises that are there. You know, that's what it's all about. The last thing that we're going to see, um, that we're going to point out, you're going to find more things. But the last thing we want you to see is he keeps telling us, I'm going to prepare the way. I'm, I'm going to prepare the way for this to happen. Not just for this these trees, not just for this vineyard, um, but for you and for me and for um, President Nelson and for everybody who is Laban. in the work of building the kingdom. He's going to prepare the way for that. And we can trust that, that where we don't see something working out right, that we can look to him where he says, um, wherefore go to and call servants, that we may labor diligently with our might in the vineyard, that we may prepare the way, that I may bring forth again the natural fruit. And um, I love when he talks about us, wherefore let us go to and labor with our might. Mm. That, it, that it's us. We're, we're working together and with him in and, this process. And it's worth doing it with all your might because it's for people. Yeah. So this, like there, who cares if you lose a tree in real life? <laughs> You know, like you're sort of like you read this and you're like, that dude loves his trees. <laughs> and you know, no one loves trees that yeah. much, but it's like, it's people and it's yeah. worth all of that. Yeah. Um, I just found this today and just kind of put this together, but because um, chapter four, remember in three was Jacob, like, let me persuade you to like, look to him. Let me persuade you to set your heart on Jesus. And then all of a sudden he tells this story in five and then in six, he comes back and he says, let me tell you why I told you that story. And look at chapter 6, verse 4. He says, how merciful is our God. Hmm. He stretches forth his hand unto them all day long. And verse 5, the, the way verse 5 is worded, I have to work through a little bit when it says, when the Lord's like, draw near unto me and I will draw near unto you. I have to like work through those kind of verses when I read them. Like I don't love them. How verse five is how I read them in my mind. And he says this, I beseech you in words of soberness, repent and come with full purpose of heart and cleave unto God as he cleaveth unto you. His arm of mercy is extended towards you. Um, And then he asks this question, after you've been nourished by the good word of God all day long, will you then reject his words? Will you, would, would you reject his prophets? Would you reject everything that's been spoken about him? That's all in verse eight. I love that he's saying like, once you know what his character's like, mm-hmm. that's why you're going to want to 
go through the mess yeah. and trust him and and be with him because you know what he's like now yeah so and i love and just maybe as our final thought um going along with that same thing of remembering that he's merciful and remembering this character of christ and how he's reaching out to all of us i love in verse 74 it says and thus they labored with all diligence and if you look up the Greek for that word diligence, it would tell you with might and vigor and power and strength and substance, that it was a force of good working in that place. And that's who Jesus Christ is. Yeah. And that is how he does his work. And that's what we should be looking for, I think, is as we look, we need to remember when we go after the ones in the nethermost part of the vineyard, we don't go out there alone. Um, it, that's us. And that is him working with as much diligence and might as we are putting in every single day. And it's, it's a rescue and it's a preserving and it's a gathering in, um, and embracing. And this is the family of God and we are doing his work and it's just, oh, it is a good time to be a part of this work yeah. that's going on. Amen. Okay. All right. We'll see you next week, everyone. Let's see the next. Yes.